From the Pittsburgh Ledger, PL Media, and The Drop, this is a podcast exploring the accountability murders in Pittsburgh. I'm Julia Page, and we're asking, who is no one? Some people aren't actually worth running through a wall for. And that's something I should have learned a long time ago. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm Julia Page, a reporter for the Pittsburgh Ledger. And as usual, I'm joined by the Ledger's Metro editor, Teddy Barstow. Howdy. So once again, we find ourselves on the back foot. We're going to focus this episode on building a profile of no one to try to get into the mind of the digital hacktivist and vigilante who is ground zero for everything that has happened so far. But there have been developments on multiple fronts that demand our attention, so we're going to follow the story where it takes us. That said, before we dive in, I do want to take a moment to consider our original premise for the episode. Because if we're serious about trying to answer who is no one, then I think we also need to consider the type of person they might be. What brings a person to the point of building an anonymous digital persona to try and incite justice against those who have used their power to abuse the system? And when that goes sideways, what brings them to put on a costume and turn vigilante, seemingly, based on their own statement, in an attempt to make amends for the unintended consequences? Which is, in this case, multiple murders and murderers. What kind of person takes that leap? Someone fed up with our systemic problems? Someone who feels let down? Hurt. Maybe someone who has lost loved ones under troubling circumstances. Did tragedy lead to the creation of no one? Could be. Tragic origin story. That train is never late. So, before we get to current events, I just wanted to put this out there for listeners to consider. When you think about who no one is, given only what we legitimately know about him thus far, what do you see? Teddy, what do you see? I see someone potentially with a conscience. The statement he made to you, Julia, about his need to account for what he's opened up here, it's possible he knows he's screwed up and is trying to put the genie back in the bottle. The word that comes to mind for me is desperate. Why desperate? Because desperation spurs action. And that's what we're seeing now. The shift back in December from behind the keyboard to in person... I agree with you, Teddy. I do think he's trying to fix what he's responsible for starting. But so far, he's stopped fewer murders than Richard Rowe and the copycat have committed. Desperate, but with a conscience. As good a place to start as any. Hopefully, next week, when we take a deeper dive into no one. Okay, then. So the big headlines on the big board. Unfortunately... There's been another murder. Pittsburgh Paints and Protectives, or P3, as the global paint manufacturer is more commonly known, lost one of its most prominent executives this week. Tobias North was killed in the style to which we have unfortunately become accustomed. Four shots to the chest, close range. This is the fourth killing by the Richard Rowe copycat. Third copycat. Right. Now, what makes this one unique is that it was preceded by a secret communication sent from the copycat to Aaron Kern, a mailed letter informing Aaron of his intention to murder Tobias North. We'll get into the contents of the letter and its significance a little later. We've got a few other topics we'd like to get through first, including an exclusive interview that sheds light on the April murder of Three Rivers University coach Nathan Cade. But before that, in our ongoing and seemingly futile quest to keep track of the ramifications of these events, we've got news on State Senator Noah Kemp. Senator Kemp, who you may remember as the third person no one doxed and who was then attacked by Aaron Kern, has since used his victimization as a launching pad to officially announce a remarkable policy proposal. Proposition 87, or Prop 87, would essentially be a ratification of the so-called Chbosky defense we spoke about last episode, providing a clear legal defense for those who cause harm to anyone reasonably believed to be targeting them. The key words here being believe, which means they don't need proof, and target, which means it hasn't happened yet. It's a preemptive stand your ground, or as Kenneth Chbosky called it, justified self-defense. Here's a clip from Senator Kemp's announcement of the proposition. 
the threats and lies of the hysterical and the deranged can have violent, deadly consequences. And in this country, we have a right to defend ourselves against such things. Now, Proposition 87 will enshrine this right. You want to threaten us? You want to be keyboard warriors? Fine. We're warriors too. A frightening thought. Now, moving on to our next topic, we're going to take a few minutes to revisit the Coach Cade murder. Remember, Three Rivers University football coach Nathan Cade was killed in a parking garage in April, shot four times in the chest, allegedly by our current copycat killer, using the same gun that was used in the original Richard Rowe murders. Listeners may recall that a note was left on Coach Cade's body that simply read, Clarity. Police have refused to talk about the note and what it might mean citing the ongoing investigation. However, we have a recording today that may give us a better idea. This is something that came to us recently, and both Julie and I have been able to verify the identities of both parties on the recording. Having said that, we have asked PL Media to do some digital manipulation to one of the voices. Julia, do you want to tell the listeners why we've done this? What you're about to hear is an interview with the witness and the Coach Cade murder. And by that, I mean someone who knew the coach very well and makes several allegations that, well, if true, they shed light on why the coach was killed. Now, we aren't altering the voice of the witness. He is going on record. However, we've had to obscure the identity of the interviewer. That was our source's condition for sharing the audio. After some lengthy internal discussions, we've agreed to it. I also want to mention that this interview was turned over to police as it also serves as a confession to accessory to murder. We're going to present this recording in its entirety without interruption. An interview with one of Coach Cade's former players, All-American cornerback Chuck Lockdown Tate. Charles Tate. Chuck. Were you close to Coach Cade? He was my coach. (laughs) Yeah. What does that mean? What you hear about those guys the players would run through a wall for? Coach Cade was like that. And he used to coach defensive backs in the pros. I started for him at TRU for three years, and he made me at least 10 times a better player than I was. My shot in the pros, (laughs) yeah, that was because of Coach. It wasn't just a football relationship, was it? Were you also Nathan Cade's personal fixer? I don't know about all that. I helped him out when I could. You helped him with his vices. It was an open secret, Coach Kate's private parties. Chuck, you said you wanted to record this. I helped him sometimes getting girls and weed. And blow. You know, stuff like that. Let's talk about the first thing you listed. Girls. Look, I'm not a pimp. Don't, don't get it twisted. I mean, you know... I spent some time on practice squads after TRU. That shit, you can only do that for so long. I mean, eventually you figure out that life isn't gonna happen for you. You gotta make some money. We're adults, right? I know a lot of people who are into different things and if I could connect some like-minded folks who wanna, you know, do business together, they kick me something for my time, hey, I'm happy to facilitate. Does that business include trafficking women? It wasn't like that. I mean, nobody was stolen from another country and turned out. Nothing like that. I mean, these were escorts, college girls trying to make rent, dancers looking to supplement. Talk to me about the note that was left with Coach Cade when he was killed. Clarity. What was that a reference to? You said you wanted to do this, Chuck that it was important that people finally know the truth, that you would regret- Clarity was a girl. A woman, I shouldn't have said that. Um, she was old enough, she, Clarity was like her stage name. Did you know her real name? Nah, I mean, she was cool and all, but I didn't know nothing about her, except that Coach really liked her and that she liked him, you know, right back, and, and she liked to party. She was at maybe two or three of Coach's gigs. What? This was 2012. I moved back to Pittsburgh in 07. 
Did you use the drugs you provided? Coke and weed? Yeah, man, but it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't until it was? No. Yeah. Can you expand on that? She was with Coach, and they were alone. I wasn't in the room or nothing. I, I didn't see exactly what happened, just what he told me. It was 2012, like I said, Coach's big spring break party, and the next morning, everybody was pretty much gone, and I was waiting to take the last of the ladies home. Coach came out of his room, tripping, like, there was smudges of blood on his mouth. He, he said he was trying to revive her, you know, mouth to mouth or something. To be clear, she died. Are you saying Kate killed her? Well, he said it was an accident. I mean, they were partying too much and it went overboard. I mean, he went too far. And she was gone. No one else knew about this? Just me and him. Where did you take her body? To the dump. Do you know anything else about Clarity? Did anyone come looking for her? No. Coach told me not to talk about it. I never did. So you don't know if anyone knew she was gone or what happened? Or if anyone even reported her missing? You know what? I've had to live with this for 12 years, right? Talking about this shit. That's the last thing I ever wanted to do. Then why are you? Because some people aren't actually worth running through a wall for. And that's something I should have learned a long time ago. I mentioned before that internally we had quite a few discussions before we decided to play this for you today. <clears throat> Obviously, there are some very serious allegations here. And to our knowledge, based on police sources, Mr. Tate is currently cooperating with investigators. He did, after all, admit to improperly disposing of a human body and possibly assisting in the disposal of a homicide victim. On our end, we're also working to dig up sources to try and determine the status of the victim's homicide investigation, if there ever was one. There's no doubt people out there wondering what happened to their friend or sister or daughter our daughter, and it's just... I'm sorry. It's okay. I think we all need time to digest. Why don't we move on to the letter? Yeah, yeah. One last thing that bears pointing out, though. Chuck Tate swore that nobody else knew what happened, but that can't be true. The copycat knew. Okay, now to the letter, which is a bit of a misnomer, actually, because it wasn't a letter. It was an envelope containing a magazine article, sent to Aaron Kern in prison, days before the murder of P3's Tobias North. It was an article about Mr. North. Now, Aaron never got to actually see this, because it was intercepted by the staff at the prison. Should we go through it together? Just the relevant part. This is from... Impact, a local Pittsburgh community magazine, dated September 23rd of last year. The piece in question is called P3's Three P's, Pollute, Perjure, Profit. Two years ago, 700,000 tons of toxic waste were dumped from the New Jersey coast by P3 employees. At the time, P3 spokespeople alleged that these employees were acting of their own accord and against P3 protocol, stating that said employees were fired for their malpractice. P3 executive Tobias North claimed as such under oath during the ensuing court case brought on by a whistleblower. But several P3 workers, who wished to remain anonymous, citing fear of retaliation, claimed that the employees were operating under company direction and were paid accordingly to take the blame for P3. Okay, we'll stop it there. Now, one more thing that's worth mentioning about this clipped article that was sent to Aaron Kern, the first appearance of North's name in the article had been highlighted. Well, if the allegations are true, it explains the the whistleblower is right note found on North's body. The magazine article was sent before North's killing. Is the copycat telling Kern that he will continue his Richard Rowe work? Does he know Aaron Kern personally? 
Are they working together somehow? Or is this just a twisted imitator looking for approval from their idol? Of course, we don't know. Evidence of attempted communication between the two is significant, but without further context. It doesn't get us closer to the truth. And the irony is that the letter could have done just that. So, that's the next part for us to talk about. Why and how this letter almost led law enforcement directly to the copycat. The letter from, presumably, the copycat to Aaron Kern that called attention to Tobias North was intercepted three days before North's murder, enough time for police to have intervened. However, that might have been possible if the letter had actually been turned over to the police when it was intercepted. Unfortunately, according to sources close to the situation, prison staff tried to sell the letter to a news outlet. 36 hours later, someone in the media, who was not offered the letter but had firsthand knowledge of its existence, caught wind of what was happening and contacted police, which led to officers almost reaching North in time. When police arrived on the scene, North was already dead. However, according to police sources, the masked copycat killer was still on the premises. It's unclear what happened that allowed for the copycat's escape. How did he know to go to Tobias North's aid? Perhaps a source in the police department? Possibly. What we know for sure is that no one fought the copycat a second time, and this time it was caught on private security cameras. Does that mean we can finally rule out no one and the copycat killer being the same person? I feel like the reasonable among us had ruled that out already. But to Teddy's point, it's confirmation. A puzzle piece that didn't fit. We're ruling out possibilities, trying to pull the picture into focus, even if it feels like a game of inches. What strikes me about everything we've just talked about is how things seem to be breaking bad, even in small ways. If the prison staff had followed protocol and turned in the letter, rather than someone holding on to it to make a quick buck, Law enforcement or no one might have intervened in time to save Tobias North's life. Instead, someone was selfish, and someone else ended up dead. A source close to the situation said that the prison staff member, who has not been identified, has been fired and may ultimately be charged. I've been told that the individual expressed regret and would only add that they were really desperate. There's that word again. Without knowing their circumstances, it's hard to know what they meant. Did desperation drive Clarity to do things she must have known were dangerous? Did she believe she had no other choice? We're all desperate in some way to find answers, to make amends, to hold others accountable. Maybe that's a good point to leave it for today. Next episode, I think we're finally going to take a shot at answering the titular question of this podcast. Who is no one? Who are the leading suspects and why? We'll lay out our theories as they stand. Hey, look at you go. That was a great tease. Unless we get derailed by new breaking developments, which will almost certainly be the case. <sighs> Thank you all for listening. For the Pittsburgh Ledger and The Drop, this is Who Is No One. I'm Julia Page, and he's Teddy Barstow. If you haven't already, please remember to like and subscribe. You can also follow us on social media and Twitter. We are at The Drop PL. Back to you next month for what's sure to be... A big one. Stay safe, Pittsburgh. To read more about No One, head to blackmarket.la. Who is No One is produced in partnership with Black Market Narrative and ZQ Entertainment. Black Market Narrative.